Good morning, good afternoon, hello to everybody wherever you are. Welcome to our hopefully for time being last version of Global AppSec due to the COVID pandemic. I look forward to the next in-person one at the end of the year in San Francisco, but now we go on the virtual one and welcome to you all. I cannot say how much I oh, enough how much I'm thrilled and happy to announce the first opening keynote speaker, Lisa Forte, Forte I think. Uh, it's a cybersecurity expert, and who doesn't know her? She started her career in securing or trying to secure uh, stop pirates from attacking ships in the coast of Somalia. She has been in the UK counterterrorism intelligence before moving into the UK cybercrime unit. She founded her own company, Red Goat Cybersecurity, in 2017. Lisa is a professional speaker, trainer, entrepreneur. A documentary personality and vlogger. I think I could go on for uh, taking all the hour of, uh, of the speech for announcing her. She has, uh, it's a, she's an expert in risk management, insider threats, and social engineering. Uh, she has founded, um, sorry, she has founded a cyber for good movement called Cyber Volunteers 19. An organization provides pro bono help and advice to help and protect hospital, hospitals around Europe from cyber tech during the pandemic. She also founded Respect and Security, and I think that's on our heart for everybody, a volunteering organization helping to stamp out the hate and harassment in our industry. So I think that's a big thing what she is doing as well. Uh, with no further ado, welcome to this conference. And here you go, Lisa Forte, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. I'll just share my screen. Hello everyone, um, welcome, I'm Lisa Forte. Um, that's quite an introduction that he gave me. Um, I'm a cybersecurity professional um, and I specialize in training, um, designing sort of programs and, and risk management programs and then running cyber crisis exercises for companies around the world. Um, and I'm really fascinated generally by risk and how we manage risk at different levels, both human, technical, um, and, and how we sort of manage that. And that's very much reflected in my personal life. So if any of you um, happen to follow me online in, on any of the platforms, you'll notice that I'm a climber, I'm a caver, um, and I explore abandoned mines for fun. Um, and all of that involves the management of risk in difficult environments, potentially constantly changing environments. And so all of that plays into my sort of general interest in this area and how we manage risk. And the talk I'm going to give today is how we manage risk from the inside. We talk a lot in security about how we manage risk from protecting against um, nefarious actors who are outside of our organization, how we stop them attacking our organization and the assets that we have. But we also have to be mindful that sometimes that threat can come from the inside, especially when we're dealing with things like developers, when we're dealing with IP, when we're dealing with um, any sort of R&D or, or commercially sensitive information, this can be really, really attractive to insider threats. So I'm going to start by asking who are insiders, because I think this is a concept that's largely misunderstood. Um, most of us would say an insider was an employee. And that is correct. But often what we forget is insiders can also be contractors who work in our business. They can be board members, they could be suppliers who maybe have a lot of access into the company and into the business. They could be interns or volunteers as well who work again inside the business. An insider is just somebody who has been given authorized access to the things that the company does. That's all it is. And they can actually pose a really substantial risk to the business potentially because they have not only been given the access legitimately to, for example, uh, source code for something or um, you know, intellectual property or a chemical formula for a drug or whatever it is the business does, not only have they been given legitimate access to some of those assets, which in itself delivers a bit of risk, they've also got the knowledge of the business. They've often got a knowledge of how the business works, what security is in place, who's responsible for 
um, delivering that security or enforcing that security. Um, <clears throat> there's been loads of cases of fraud, for instance, inside large organizations where they know how the audits are done. So they know how to avoid being detected by those audits. So they can pose a really, really big challenge, both from the perspective that you've got the, the access that, to be honest, a lot of attackers would dream of having. And then you combine that with the knowledge potentially to avoid or obfuscate what you're doing and avoid detection. And those two things combined make it a very difficult threat to manage and to um, sort of mitigate, I suppose. Now, another thing that always comes my way in, when I talk about insider threats is people say to me, what is an insider threat? Who are they? What do they look like? Are they men? Are they women? How old are they? What's the sort of profile? And if you look at the data from US CERT, there is no one single demographic profile of an insider threat. We have seen every possible gender, age, race, religion, everything um, becoming insider threats. So there's no sort of one profile of person. It's not more likely to be an older person or a younger person. Um, it, it very much depends on job role. And I'll come on to that in a moment when I talk about the different types of attacks that we see from insiders. So the first thing I wanna tackle <clears throat> is the difference between an unintentional insider and an intentional insider. And from an unintentional perspective, we're talking about people who maybe make a mistake, who click on that link in a phishing email, or who are maybe negligent in something that they do, or they send something to the wrong person, or they're reckless in what they do. In all of those situations, they don't intend to cause harm to the organization. They don't intend to steal something. They don't intend to commit fraud. It's an, an accident, a mistake. I actually don't like calling people insiders who have made mistakes, insider threats, because I sort of feel that it puts a really horrible um, sort of title on someone who's essentially made a mistake, which is something we all do on an almost daily basis or something I do on an almost daily basis anyway. However, these people are unintentional. They are just going about their daily business, trying to do their job and something that they do causes uh, the manifestation of a risk. We're not going to talk about those kinds of people in this talk. We're talking about the other type, which is intentional insiders. So these are people who within the organization, whether they're a contractor, an employee, a board member, whoever it is, they intend to do the thing they do. So this could be intentionally taking um, sensitive information. This could be intentionally planting a logic bomb or creating a backdoor. All of these things are done with intent, and that, that's the topic of, of this talk today. Now, people often also use the phrase malicious insider, which is also really misleading because malice is one motivation for doing these things, but it's not the only motivation. Intentional insiders intend to do what they do, but they don't necessarily do it because of malice. Sometimes they do it because they're in a really difficult financial position and this is a way to make quick money to pay for a health bill or to, to do something like that. So they're not malicious, they're not being malicious necessarily. They are doing it for a different reason. So we see money being a motivator, fear, blackmail sometimes, sometimes revenge and malice. There's a whole spectrum of reasons why people do these things. Um, so don't just reduce it down to malice. So there are three types of intentional insider attacks that we see. We have theft, which could be um, usually sort of the, 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 um, the theft of intellectual property or research and development or um, things like that. So you'll usually see it um, in roles where you have, for example, scientists, engineers, um, developers, anyone who's doing something that's creating something, I suppose you could say, within the business. Those are the roles that are the most at risk for theft, because if you think about it, let's just use the example of a pharmaceutical company. If you've got a scientist who's working on a drug, a brand new drug, he's got access to really sensitive information. The HR person probably wouldn't have access to the formulas for that drug that they're working on. So they have less opportunity to commit theft. 
than, than the scientist does in that situation. So that's theft. We also have sabotage. This is usually committed by techies, unfortunately, uh, by our kind of group of individuals. So it's usually techies, security professionals, people like that, privileged users of some description, um, just purely because everything we do is, is digital. So they have the opportunity to sabotage stuff, delete accounts, um, interfere with code, stuff like that. So sabotage is usually done by, by techies. And finally, we have fraud. Um, and this is usually committed by lower level employees, people who work in sort of data entry roles predominantly, who can change details on bank accounts or insurance policies in order to um, financially enrich themselves, I suppose. <clears throat> so the next argument that people put forward and another uh, myth, I suppose, that I'd like to dismiss is that people who do these things are what we'd say in the UK, bad apples or inherently evil bad people. And I hate this argument because firstly, I think it's rather naive. And I think it's also an argument that can really put your organization at risk. So let's take an example. Let's imagine for a moment that your life has taken a turn for the worse. Your partner has left you. You're going through a divorce. You're very, very stressed you're fighting a custody battle, um, let's say money's really tight, the, you know, your bills are adding up, you've got this financial pressure, you've just found out that your mum is really, really ill, and, you know, you need some money to help with her care, you can't even really afford to run your car at the moment, you're in a really difficult situation, and at work, your manager is just not a nice person, they're really difficult, they're making your life hell, um, then they're putting up all these barriers to your job. You thought you were going to get this promotion, but it gets given to somebody else who's nowhere near as experienced as you. If you imagine being in that situation, you're probably pretty close to breaking point. You're probably feeling pretty isolated. You're probably feeling pretty desperate. You're probably feeling really disenfranchised with your life and with the things that are happening. And let's imagine that a foreign competitor to your, to your employer contacts you and says, well, here's 10,000 euros as a golden hello. Come and take a job with us. Just bring along some of the code you've been working on. Bring along that report you've been working on and we'll give you this money. All of a sudden, when you're in that desperate situation and things are really, really bad for you, that looks attractive. That looks like a good option. That looks like a life vest to get you through this difficult time. And this is the problem. We reduce it down to these people are evil, but more often than not, and in almost every case I've looked at, the people who do these things have been in a difficult situation. And it's just sort of snowballed to the point where eventually they do this. So this has become such a big problem. Um, people being contacted online, usually on LinkedIn, but not just on LinkedIn, and encouraged to give information over about what they're working on or share things they shouldn't share. And it's become such a big problem that in the UK, MI5, one of our intelligence agencies, uh, worked with the Centre for Protection of National Infrastructure to develop an app, which you can download from the App Store, which is all about educating people how to spot suspicious profiles online, how to, 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 to make sure you're not handing over confidential information. MI5 claim that over 100,000 Brits have actually been targeted um, in order to get confidential information on what their company is working on. And fake profiles are so easy to make online. You can quite easily make something super convincing that you look like a recruiter or an HR professional or whoever it is, and you can contact people and try and get information about their business and what they're working on and what the sort of projects are that they're working on. For example, in the first quarter of 2020, Facebook claimed that they took down 4.5 billion profiles just in the first quarter that were fake. In that same time frame, LinkedIn claimed they took down 7.3 million. Twitter estimate that between five to 15% of all of their accounts are fake. So this is a really big problem. And this is a problem that as a society, we're going to have to really look at tackling 
because some of these attacks can be really convincing. And I'm going to tell you an example of how some of these things could manifest. So this gentleman, we'll call him Rob, is a scientist, let's say. He works in this company. He's a really good scientist. He's been going through a bit of a difficult time. He's been having a divorce. He's, you know, it's in the pandemic. He's, he's working hard and he's a bit lonely, like a lot of people got during the pandemic. And one day he posts on LinkedIn and someone comments on his post. And this person is a woman and she asks a question that says something about the nature of his post. So he's really intrigued and he replies back to her and he decides to send her a direct message to explain further what he was meaning. So he writes this direct message to her and they start a back and forth. They start talking about science. It turns out she's a scientist as well for a different company. They start discussing all sorts of things and the relationship turns a bit more romantic, let's say. They become really close friends, a little bit romantic relationship going on. And she starts asking lots and lots of questions about his job. He's working on a very, very sensitive project at the moment. He works for a big company in a lab and she's asking lots of questions about what he does. And he's really flattered. So he's sending her lots of information. He's telling her lots of stuff that he's working on. She wants to see what he's doing and wants to discuss the science behind some of those things. And obviously he's really flattered by this whole process. So the relationship progresses and as COVID was locked down, she's saying to him regularly, you know, oh, I've taken up dancing and um, I'm getting really good at it and I want to post some videos and create a YouTube channel. Would you mind reviewing some of my dancing videos? So he's pretty flattered. She's a beautiful woman, a beautiful Bulgarian scientist. Oops, sorry. Um, and he says, okay, yeah, sure. So she sends him some videos and she, he watches them and, you know, he sort of replies with the expected responses that you'd have, you'd have thought he would. And then one day he's at work in the office and she says to him, oh, you know, I'm about to upload this new video. Um, would you mind if you just quickly reviewed it? Yeah, sure. Send it to me. So she sends it to him. It arrives on his phone. He tries to click on it. It doesn't open. Sends a response saying, tried to open it on my phone, won't open. She says, oh, no, no, that's because it won't open on a phone. It, it just doesn't like the operating system. You have to open it on a, on a Windows device. OK, so knowing that he shouldn't do this, he forwards the email from his personal email to his work account. He goes into the open plan office, goes into the email, opens the email, clicks on the video. Still doesn't play. Replies to her again and says, look, it's still not playing. I don't, I don't know why it's broken, but it's broken. I'm sorry. So she replies, oh yeah, I had that problem too. It turns out that on the newer laptops on the newer Windows devices, it just won't play. I don't suppose you have like a really old device, a really old laptop, a really old computer of some description that's running some sort of really old programs. Um, I think some of the new software interferes with the video. So he thinks, okay, there's only one place in this organization where we have really old devices and that's in the lab. So they're running really old software for reasons that they need to, to run that software. So into the lab he goes and he's got the file that he's downloaded onto a USB stick, goes into the lab, plugs it into one of the lab computers, which he knows he shouldn't do, goes to open the, the video still doesn't open. So at this point, he's getting frustrated and he said, look, I'm really sorry. Um, you know, I've tried to open it. I've, I've done it in the lab where we're running sort of really old Windows software and it's still not opening. Um, I'm sure it will be great. Just post it on YouTube. I'll watch it later. And it turned out that the video was a little bit less MP4 and a little bit more malware. And thankfully, the company discovered this and no damage was done. But this person had managed to convince him to break security rule after security rule after security rule. And he intentionally, knowingly did all of those things 
because he met this person and he thought he was reviewing a video that she was wanting to post online. So insiders are valuable. I mean, if you think about what I just told you, that example, it's very common that they'll get you talking about your work and you'll, th and you'll be quite happy to do so because you're relatively flattered that someone is that interested in what you do. Um, they'll ask for proof of things that you're working on, documents, files, things like that. Um, we've seen people who have actually managed to get confidential reports screenshotted and sent to them as well. Um, and I think there is a social engineering side of it, which I won't go into, which is the, the people who are creating these fake profiles, contacting you under a pretext and getting you to hand over information or to do something. But you have to also see that from the insider perspective, these people are, these insiders are breaking security rules, passing information they shouldn't, being sort of, I guess, lured into the promise of financial enrichment or, or whatever it is. Um, so insiders are incredibly valuable. Now in security, we love a kill chain. Kill chains for everything, every type of attack, let's map it out like this. So typically, um, the way we kind of see this work is that whoever it is, whether it's a nefarious actor, like an attacker, whether it's a competitor, whether it's a foreign state, whoever the actor is behind the, the plan to get the information, they'll obviously do some reconnaissance on the business. Maybe they'll have targeted specific businesses, especially for theft, specific businesses that um, are developing really interesting software or developing sort of uh, really interesting, interesting engineering projects or the vaccine, for example, during COVID. There'll be a first contact. So it will usually be something pretty innocuous. It will be something a bit um, usually quite friendly, nothing massively um, to raise any alarm bells. Over time, they will build some rapport with you to make you think that they are a recruiter or whoever the pretense is that they are, they're coming to you from. Then they'll usually test that rapport. So they'll ask you for something really little to just see whether you'll do the thing that they're asking you to do. Then they'll do the attacks so or the execution of the orders, what they actually want to achieve, which from this situation is usually to steal information. Um, the other insider attacks are a little bit more personal. Um, and we'll come on to those in a moment. But from a theft perspective, usually if you're looking at sort of corporate or industrial espionage or you're looking at state based espionage, um, this is usually to steal information. Sometimes it's to sabotage the company as well, but that's usually pretty noisy. So it's it's more about acquiring source code or acquiring uh, chemical formulas or whatever it is. And then they'll usually extract from the engagement pretty swiftly. And this will usually be that the profiles that they had online get deleted really quickly. Um, sometimes they'll have a whole story of why they need to sort of disappear. Um, and that's usually done so that they can re-enter again and contact you again later on if they need to. Um, and sometimes they do genuinely offer people jobs, give them money to steal the information, and then those jobs do in fact exist and people go on and, and do those jobs. So it's not always that it's it's all a lie, but it's definitely got some intent behind it that perhaps you didn't realize. So some of the things that we see as like the approaches or the reasons why people might approach you, especially for theft, this is specifically to get you to take something from your company that you shouldn't take and give it to somebody who shouldn't have it for whatever reason. So we often see this from uh, recruitment is a big one. In fact, in the MI5 campaign, they talk a lot about recruiters, people who are claiming to be recruitment consultants or HR people in a company who are recruiting you. I have actually had some conference invites where people have invited me to speak at events. And let's just say that some of the invites have been incredibly suspicious. I've had a few friends who've also had this happen to them um, where they wanted information on things that you just suddenly think, mm, this is a bit weird. I'm not sure this is a real conference at all. 
Um, we can, we've also seen it from romance and friendship, like in the example I gave, um, that woman starting a, a romantic relationship, also, you know, friendship as well can also work. Business opportunities, consultancy work, investment in your company or your new business, promises of business partnerships and all of this sort of thing um, is, is really, really common as reasons that they might contact you in order to, to get you to do something. So we've talked a little bit about how this can be done from the perspective of an outsider manipulating you on some level to do it, but this can also happen from people themselves in their own organizations. And there's two kind of examples that I wanna give you from the sort of techie space, I suppose. So I'll start with theft. So in this case, um, the person in question was an engineer. They worked at a sort of visual simulation software company and they resigned. And at their exit interview, they were asked, have you returned all of the devices? Have you returned, you know, do you have any copies of any of the code, blah, blah, blah. And um, they said, they sort of lied at this in exit interview and they said, yeah, I've returned absolutely everything there's nothing I have um, at all so they leave and that's all sort of tied up from the company's perspective and they decide that they're going to become sort of self-employed a consultant and it turns out that actually they had stolen the source code for this new product they then over the next year actually spent time coercing people who they'd previously worked with at this company to give them more information and more um, sort of interesting pieces of, of R&D, I suppose you could say, related to this. So that happened over the course of probably just under a year. And then they accepted a job for another company. So they decided to leave the consultancy space. They accepted this job where they went to work for this other company that was a competitor of the company that they'd stolen the source code of. So they go and work for this company and obviously develop this stolen, this stolen code into another product. And they go to this conference and they, this company that they're now working for, they do this big launch of this product. And it just so happened that representatives of his previous employer were at the same event and saw that the product that they were launching was 100% a stolen product from their company, put two and two together and went, oh my God, they've stolen all this stuff. So in this particular instance, actually, the, the company was really lucky because they actually reported it to the authorities and the, they actually found evidence that this individual had stolen this source code and then they'd taken that and given it to this competitor developed this product, launched it, the whole sort of chain was proven. Um, and they got, I think it was $10,000 fine. And I think they got two years in jail as a result of it, this individual. So in that particular case, in some ways they were too noisy about it maybe with the launch, I don't know, um, but they got caught. And this individual actually was put in prison for it. So it is a crime. We have to be aware that that is a crime. Um, and sometimes companies do actually have the ability to prove that someone has stolen these things. So that's theft, that's stealing of something. In some ways, sabotage is harder to understand. Um, and this often happens because most of the situations with sabotage happen because someone is angry with their employer, they're disgruntled, they are um usually either planning on leaving or actually handed in their notice and they want revenge sabotage comes from a, a feeling of anger a feeling of sort of beyond discontent really disgruntlement perhaps and the need to sort of exact revenge on this employer that you think has done something bad to you so in this case, um, there was a software developer and they actually were terminated from their job for poor performance. And 
they they left the company and they actually got a job their next job with a subsidiary of that same company which was a bit odd and that was about a month later or so but what had happened was the company that had fired this person hadn't deactivated his accounts so he managed over the course of a few months to access I think it was something like 30 odd user accounts he got into people's emails he managed to review and change code that was being used within the organization um, deleted like software um, modification notices uh, created accounts he actually deleted uh, or removed both the CEO and the CFO's accounts at one point, completely disabled them. Um, there was a, a sysadmin in the organization who actually would log into her account and see that someone had logged in an hour ago and he was logging in and doing stuff from the sysadmin account. So he had all this access and they hadn't disabled any of it. They hadn't um, changed anything. And he was really good at deleting logs, hiding what he was doing, um, and sort of just generally being a nuisance. And it wasn't until they actually changed some employees around within the company that they did a review of all the accounts, and this was a long time afterwards, um, that they realized what was happening. And this gentleman was sort of having, I suppose in, in English law terms, going off on a frolic of his own and sort of doing all these sorts of things. So again, he was sort of interfering and, and sabotaging. And in that case, they didn't, he didn't do an awful lot of damage. It was more being a nuisance really, more than it was causing huge damage. But we have seen in sabotage cases, people planting logic bombs. We have seen people creating back doors. We have seen people creating accounts and then selling them on the dark web or defacing the company website has happened a lot. Um, so we've seen a lot of these things happen. And again, like I said at the very beginning, because all our businesses are run digitally now, almost all the cases involving sabotage are techies because we are privileged account holders. We are pretty much the only people in the business who could really do a lot of damage when it comes to sabotage. Um, and if you think about it from your own roles, if you wanted to sabotage the organization, there's a lot of ways you could do it that would be hugely damaging. So those are sort of a few more examples, I suppose, of how insiders have, as I said at the beginning, the access to the crucial things. So account modification, codes, IP, all of the sort of crucial systems applications and assets that a company might have insiders have access to those legitimately they also have the knowledge of how to hide things so especially techies um, especially people who work in it security you know how to hide your tracks you know how to cover things up you may even be the person responsible for spotting these things so you have an ability to cover your tracks very easily, which an outsider doesn't have the same capability as an insider for doing that. So insider threats can be a huge, huge problem. And specifically, they are a massive problem for any company that's working in sort of a high R&D space. So things like uh, businesses in the new economy market, so anything to do with technology, um, but also sort of scientific based industries as well, um, especially for theft, really very vulnerable to uh, insider attacks. So what do we do? Well, one of the kind of key things that I've been working on recently is developing um, an awareness of everybody into creating insider threat programs and feeding into insider threat programs. So in the US, they tend to be a little bit more advanced on this concept than in Europe and, and the UK. Um, but we should all have insider threat programs operating within our, our organization, just like we do for all other elements of security. And I argue that there's four elements that need to go into that insider threat program. The first one is training. So stripped back down, recognize 
potentially malicious profiles online, people who might be trying to contact you because you are working in the AppSec space, you are an attractive mark, potentially, you're going to have access to things that are interesting, that are uh, valuable, financially valuable. So because of that, you have to be a little bit more aware of what potentially malicious profiles might be like. So if you have an opportunity, go and download the CPNI app it's on the App Store, free to download, um, was created by um, MI5 and CPNI, go download it and, and just go through the training program. It's really quick, really easy, it gives you a bit of an idea of what these profiles look like. Um, so training is really good to, to make sure that we're aware of what this sort of thing looked like. But also if you're having a conversation with somebody online and just, just look at the way the conversation is going. And what I mean by that is, if you're having a conversation with someone who's pretending to be a friend or a recruiter or whoever they're pretending to be, and you don't know this person, look at the conversation and think, is this normal? Does this look like a conversation I would have with other friends or other recruiters or other business people? Because the chances are, if they're trying to get information out of you, they are probably asking you questions and you are probably doing all the talking. And generally in a conversation, it's pretty balanced. It's pretty 50-50. If it doesn't look that way, just allow that to trigger some alarm bells in you. And then think about how you would report these things if they happened or, you know, if you spot somebody within your organization who you think might be doing something they ought not to be doing, how do you report that? So that's training. Support. Um, one of the things I talk about a lot is that actually one of the best ways to stop insider threats happening within your organization is for employees to feel supported and to feel like they've got someone to turn to if they've got problems. So using the example of sabotage, for instance, as I said before, we know sabotage happens because somebody is angry. They are taking revenge out against their company. So if you have a situation where you can detect that this person is really unhappy in their role, that maybe they're going through financial troubles, maybe they're having a hard time personally, maybe they're having mental health problems, gambling issues, or whatever it is that's happening to them that's affecting their life, um, you can put in place, as organizations, can put in place employee assistance programs to help them, to stop them from getting to the point where they are angry or in financial trouble and thinking about potentially taking something and selling it to somebody else. We have the ability to provide support for our staff and employees to the degree that actually they're not vulnerable to being manipulated. They're not vulnerable to being approached and offered money because we are there to help them and support them if they need it. And that is a real, real key point. If you're going to have an insider threat program that works, it has to be based off of that. We also need uh, ability for people to report stuff. So we need to have an ability to whistleblow. I mean, on my on my website, red-goat.com, red there is a white paper, research paper that I, that I did a few years ago, um, free to download, um, go and have a look at it. It talks about how reluctant we are to report people who are doing something. And in this piece of research, we looked at, we gave all of the participants um, a set of scenarios of things that they saw somebody in their organization doing. And some of these things were outrageously bad. And it turned out that in fact, the only people they were happy to go and report and say, this person's doing something dodgy, this person's doing something bad. The only category of people they were happy to do that for were contractors, <laughs> nobody else colleagues they didn't want to report if their boss was doing something bad they didn't want to report that either um, and it turned it was actually quite surprising that people felt I can't go and report on a colleague I can't go and report on a manager who's doing something they shouldn't be doing so you have to think about that as well how can we encourage people within our companies to say oh I don't think something's right with this person I'm a bit concerned about them or I saw them doing some, this thing that they shouldn't be doing and how can we do that 
in a supportive way that doesn't penalize people, but also doesn't create this culture of, um, oh, well, you went and told on me. So now I'm going to sort of, um, in, in, you know, sort of impede your progress within in the organization. So reporting is another really important thing. And then finally, monitoring. So we do need some monitoring on some of the key, key job roles within our organization. So as I said before, going back to those three attacks, theft, going to be people who are developing software, developing um, scientists maybe who are developing chemicals or drugs or things like that, engineers who are working on projects. The people who are gonna steal stuff are gonna have access to the stealable information, right? So we could monitor that group of people. Sabotage, we know, almost completely committed uh, by security professionals, techies, developers. So some monitoring on that group of individuals. Fraud, which was the final attack. We know low level data entry roles. So we can put some monitoring on that group of people. We don't need to monitor the entire organization aggressively. That's not necessarily appropriate. In fact, um, as most of us are in Europe, in the EU, um, the European courts have been really, really clear that any monitoring you do on your staff has to be proportionate and has to be necessary and has to be restrictive. I had a company the other week who was talking to me about an insider threat program they were trying to put in place and they were talking about their monitoring and they said to me, is it okay if we can just turn on the webcams of the, the laptops, the personal laptops of our staff? And I thought, no, you, you, can't, you can't do that. That's not, that is not restrictive, that's not, that's not okay. So we do need some monitoring, but we have to make sure that that monitoring is reasonable. It's as, as small as possible. Don't do more than you have to. Um, making sure that whatever monitoring you put in place, you can actually use, because in a lot of situations, you will collect logs on things and then you have no ability to review them so there's no point in collecting them um so making sure that you're doing an, you know an, a bit of monitoring but not too much and making sure that that's really just open and honest with your staff so making sure everyone is aware of what monitoring is on them uh, and why i think is is kind of a key point so the final thought i kind of want to leave you with is I have this sort of general theory with insider threats that someone who is happy, satisfied, content, enjoying life, doesn't turn around and steal stuff from their employer, doesn't turn around and sabotage their employer. There's no need to commit fraud because you've got money, you've got lots to lose, you've got a nice life. So the more we can think about creating a work environment that's, that looks like that, for our employees, the more we reduce the threat. And I tweeted the other day that if your inside a threat program is just monitoring, 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 you've probably increased your risk of an inside a threat. So it's really important that we send the message to all of our colleagues, our staff, that actually you're not alone. If you have problems, if you have troubles, if you're going through a tough time, if you hate your job within our within the organization, we are open to having a discussion about how we improve that situation for you. And then you're reducing your vulnerability to people being paid to hand over information. You're reducing your vulnerability of people being so annoyed with your company that they want to sabotage it. And I think that's the best way to reduce the threat. So I hope you enjoyed the talk. I think we've got a few minutes for questions, hopefully from Martin. Um, but before we turn to that, I just want to quickly give a shout out to uh, Respect and Security, which is a volunteer organization that I co-founded with a bunch of other people. Um, and I really recommend you go and check them out, follow them, participate in the discussion. Um, it's a voluntary organization we created to try and stamp out hate and harassment in the sort of tech um, security industry. And there's loads of initiatives there that you can get involved with, but it's all about trying to stop 
bullying and trolling and all of that sort of thing that goes on in that industry, sadly. So please, please go and give them some support. It's a really important message. Thank you. I'm waiting for Martin. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, really great presentation as expected. And uh, yes, we have several questions. Well, first one I want to ask, how common are those insider threat attacks? I think intentional in, insider threats are, they're not hugely common, thankfully. The problem with them is when they happen, they are really, really, really serious. So it's one of those things that they don't happen a lot necessarily, but we've seen it with Tesla, for example, they had a, a really bad one not, not too long ago. We've seen it with lots of other companies that have had this sort of thing happen. They are really, usually really serious and actually really publicly embarrassing when you have to say, yeah, that was one of our developers that stole that, sorry. That's a really embarrassing thing for a company to say. There's also uh, types of companies that are more vulnerable to those attacks? Yeah, I'd say probably um, companies that operate in sort of new economy markets. So tech companies would be really vulnerable because it's such a high R&D space. We're developing new stuff all the time. Um, the other one that I've seen recently actually is the gaming space as well. So people who are working in developing um, sort of PlayStation games and things like that, that's actually a really um, aggressive market where people are getting paid a lot of money to hand over things they're working on. Okay, and the question is, uh, as you mentioned uh, for the uh, threat or tempering with code, the question is, what is the share, I think, the speed of internal threats versus external threat when it comes to code tempering theft from what have you seen during your assessments? Um, I think it's I think largely the the threat generally comes externally. Um, however, as I said before, in a lot of these situations, sometimes it can be quicker and easier to get in via social engineering by talking to somebody who works in the company and getting them to hand over information. Um, and again, it comes back to that position. So there was a gaming company recently, I forget what the name of it was, who had this situation. And it turned out one of their developers was a pretty young person. I think there's been a lot of talk in the gaming industry about how overworked people are <laughs> who develop games. Um, and this particular person was not at all satisfied with their job, was hugely stressed. Um, and I think they were paid 40,000 euros to hand over a little bit of information of what they were working on. Now, this person I think was like 26, 27. They were really young. Um, 40,000 euros is a lot of money. It's a lot of money if you think you're not gonna get caught, right? So they did, they handed it over. And I think, you see, that's where the, the line kind of blurs. It's not necessarily just only outside people, inside people, it kind of, um, the share of it can sort of, yeah, change. But I think, you know, a lot of these things, unfortunately, they're going to benefit competitors. It's not necessarily for organized criminals. It's for people who compete with your company, right? Oh, yeah. Another question is, so between the theft, leak, sabotage, or other types of tax, which one was the most popular in the past 12 months? Uh, theft, big time. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's because um, generally, I, I don't know if some of you might have heard of this, uh, they talk about the great resignation that's happening now globally, right, because of COVID and, and everything that's happened. Um, and because you've got lo loads of people moving jobs, it's a perfect opportunity to take a few copies of some of the things you've been working on and go and sell them. So I think theft is the biggest problem because um, also people, you know, it's difficult with the cost of living issues the increase in gas prices, the increase in, in lots of our bills, um, people are struggling for money as well. So if someone comes up and offers you 40,000 euros, it starts to look a bit more attractive, doesn't it? And the next uh, second part of the same question is, what are some of the forecasts for the next 12 to 24 months? Some of the forecasts, oh, that's interesting. Um, so I think one of the big problems we're going to have is this hybrid working. I think hybrid working is great for a number of reasons. I, I work I work in a hybrid working environment. My company employs hybrid working. Um, but I do think the problem is you don't have the visibility as you did when they're in the office. And the problem you have with that is that it does um, allow people to take copies of things that you might not notice. I had um, a company the other day who was an investment bank and they had people working from home and they said there's no way they'd be able 
to steal any of these documents and send them out. And I said to them, but they're working from home. So of course they can. And they said, no, 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 it's fine. They can't, we monitor all of it. They wouldn't be able to do it. And I said, well, I can do it by doing this. <sighs> Take a photo on my phone, done. And then they thought, oh yeah, they could do that, couldn't they? That would, that would work and we wouldn't notice that. So I think that's one problem that we are gonna see that hybrid working does give more opportunity to people being able to do things that they probably might not want to do in an office environment. So I think we will see more theft. Um, I do think that with sabotage, again, there's a lot of people who are going through tough times at the moment. And I think as soon as you start putting all these different pressures on people, food crises, cost of living crises, um, all of this pressure that's going on different people, I do think we might start to see people becoming more agitated and that might also go up. Yeah, thanks. Uh, one more question. Um, is reporting can go the wrong way if people just can report on colleagues they don't like or are mm -hmm. competitors in the workplace? How you go about that problem? So I think you need anonymous reporting to try and encourage people to report genuine bad behavior. But as you say, the other problem is, well, if I really hate my colleague, I'm just going to put in a report to say that she's doing all these horrible things, right? Um, and that's not necessarily true. And that comes down to then your security teams and your insider threat teams being able to go through it and actually establish whether it's true or not. Um, and that is, it is complicated. You see this happen with policing, right? There's, it's the same sort of thing. Um, and I think, yeah, so I think that the way you investigate reports has to be really fair. I think it has to be thorough. It has to be evidence-based and you have to sort of have those processes in place to ensure that if you do get people reporting on people they hate just for fun or whatever they're doing, you have a process that they don't get disciplined. Um, but it is, a, yeah, it is a genuine concern. And that's why sometimes I think we have to accept that there isn't one good solution. It's just a choice of not very good solutions. <laughs> I remember several years ago, I was uh, at a conference in the Netherlands and there was one guy and he called himself, he's not a security uh, role, he has a, he's transparency, uh, a transparency officer, because he, he wants people to be able to work transparently and they had a very transparent way to report. So it was anonymous or by name. And of course, beginning when you could report everything on everybody and the whole following up was very transparent to the one who is accused. He said, by making it very transparent, you suddenly have a, a environment where it's not blaming, but just asking, like, why are you uh, having two laptops carrying out? It's just a very normal thing like this, normally don't ask, but it was really interesting one. And they were only had um, those who did something wrong, I said, not even on purpose, but just had been tricked by uh, this, you know, tricksters, went on the video and, and explained their case. So I lost my job because I didn't saw those signs. And because they were so transparent and not just goodbye, we have to fire you, but also help them to continue with them a job outside to be even so that they come up the video, they do recording, tell their side of the story, how they have been tricked. I think that's very impressive. Yeah. Yeah. And ultimately you can help them, right? If, if you can get involved early enough, you can help them before they've done something that they can't undo. Yes, definitely. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you. For everybody else, enjoy the conference. I'm happy to also be the uh, moderator for the closing keynote for today. So enjoy the conference. Thanks again, Lisa. And I really like uh, appreciate what you do with respect and security. Uh, I think that's what we all do. Uh, need respect each other and have this a happy and joyful, eventful uh, conference. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye, everyone.